Martin, uh, you don't need the, an introduction. We all remember you, <laughs> but we are happy to have that you are going to continue with your bootcamp uh, tutorial. Please. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will give again a short recap and uh, show how this, how what we already seen how we can write do the write this in a standard workflow that is used in the bootstrap community where you write the so-called polynomial matrix problem which I explain what it is and then convert it to a semi-definite uh, problem in order to solve it efficiently using uh, the standard software stpv so we saw that in numerics we have to discretize this uh, space of functionals that can act on uh, the crossing equations uh, such as these that we found uh, looking at what uh, at the HTML. Uh, that can be written as as a uh, combination of uh, derivatives at, uh, for example, at, at z equals z bar equals one half. Um, so yeah, in numerics, usually we look for these this kinds of uh, discretization of the, the, the functional search space, and then we are looking for just some uh, uh, some combination of this. So it's uh, alpha we're looking for this alpha mn and here i've labeled mn with two indices but you can see this as uh, this m and m just range over the non-zero derivatives and we can also order that and that's what we will do as a vector so actually it's just alpha dot f where uh, the vector indices go over these non-zero derivatives And one property of these derivatives around z equals c bar is that it can be approximated to arbitrary precision by some positive function that's positive. Uh, I will comment, but for all delta that we want, we want to demand positivity on, and uh, times some polynomial. So here we see that we can approximate these derivatives by some positive factor times a, fa a factor that is just a polynomial in. Delta, and that's what will be important uh, because it means that we can write the question as a polynomial matrix problem. Because this positive factor we can just uh, divide by, and it will not affect any of the numerics. Or actually, in practice, we use it to set some skills, but uh, and such an overall positive factor uh, does not. Uh, change the question of whether a functional exists, which is to see uh, since we were looking for whether a separating plane exists for these kind of rays, and it doesn't matter whether the vector uh, gets bigger or smaller, because only its direction uh, matters. Uh, and so we actually, the standard problem that we write our crossing equations are, uh, as if we want to do numerics is a polynomial matrix problem which is a problem of this form we we are looking for some alpha uh, out of rn where n is the number of functional components so the, the number of uh, different non-zero derivatives if we use this standard discretization uh, and we're looking for an alpha that is positive when you uh, apply it to some uh, vector where each entry uh, corresponds to uh, the polynomial part of 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 of, uh, of the the f the, the crossing f function that uh, we saw before. Um, uh, for all, it has to be positive for all, let's say, delta greater than zero. But of course, you have to shift this because you often you want to, uh, you, that this depends on your spectrum. So normally, you would assume that 
you want positivity in order to exclude the spectrum you want positivity on all, everything in the assumed spectrum and so usually it would start at the unitarity bound or at a gap that you are specifically want, uh, want to study uh, so we will get back to this soon and you can also so, so often you're just looking for any so we also want to take positivity as we saw before one term and we can do that by specifying some normalization factor that corresponds to the one uh, fixed term which is often chosen to be the identity and we can also maximize some objective while we're doing this often you're only interested in just finding any alpha solution that you might be uh, interested in optim in instead of finding just any optimizing because you can get some extra information such as uh, a bound of an OP coefficient or some extra optimization that helps you find the island if you use the navigator method. So we will, uh, just like we did in the linear program, we want to demand positivity for these different uh, families of operators, which different families will be labeled by J. Uh, and so in the single correlator, I, uh, operators that we've been looking at up to now for simplicity these would just be the spins and it would be uh, only even spins due to the permutation symmetry of the operator so it would be zero two four etc until some discretized uh, uh into, sorry until some uh, maximum uh spin uh where this maximum spin should be chosen so that the numerics are not affected by each choice so yeah, so for concreteness, one of these objects that you would want to mount the positivity on is, oops, this delta should not have been in the exponent, but okay, um, is uh, for example, the spins uh, L equals zero family, and then for all delta greater than the unitarity bound, say, and uh, on these derivatives, which are labeled by this N and N. And here P is just the polynomial part of the, uh, of the deriv of this derivative of f that we saw above, so, uh, so it would be this. Uh, okay, so this is the kind of problem that we basically set up, and this is the kind of problem where I think that you should think about that you want to write your presentations in this form, because we will see that. Once you write it in this form, then we can convert it to a semi-definite problem, which has an efficient way, uh, which can be solved efficiently. So yes, as I said, this you have to normalize on some vector, and that would be your strictly positive term, which is usually chosen to be the normalization. Uh, sorry, it's usually uh, chosen to be the identity, since that's the one operator that you would just demand that is exactly at that fixed delta and L. Uh, but yeah, sometimes other options would also be like the stress tensor. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and you can choose the objective, either just put it zeros and it will just look for any feasible solution, or you can uh, choose something meaningful, which will take a bit longer, but then you get additional information. So it has a bound on the or you get so like a navigator function that tells you where you should move uh, in order to find the boundary of the loud in this loud region. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, let, let me explain why this is uh, possible, why you, for example, can get an OPE bound. So here, here I schematically add the crossing equations um, where separated by contribution of uh, some operators, where here you have, so here you have the identity, which you know is there. Say there's another operator that you want to minimize, whose uh, OP coefficient you want to minimize or maximize, then, okay, we also write that separately, and then we have a sum of all the other operators, and this is equal to zero by crossing. Now, just by the normalization of the two-point functions, we can set this to be one, and we can uh, act with all a bit some post uh, a bit some functional on this linear functional, and subtract 
we if we ask I, I actually it's a positive linear functional uh so we demand positivity then this term is strictly possible uh, positive and we can subtract it and then we can find an inequality on the remaining terms and this uh, will give you this inequality and you see now that uh, if we choose the normalization and objectives smartly then we can find an interesting bound on this so if we normalize on this contribution from this operator that we want to uh, uh, find an upper bound on in this case then uh, then okay you get an equation that just relates lambda squared to the action of alpha on this term and by max we can find the strictest upper bound and lower bound can be found in a similar way uh, by making a slightly different choice uh, which i believe is an exercise uh, for anyone who's interested in this case it will be important that you know, if you want to find a lower bound in open condition you're not Martin. allowing sorry i have a question on what you just said in the previous slide yes so you said you can find the upper bound on lambda squared for om by so you okay so you, you you choose to normalize not with respect to identity anymore but no in this case you don't normalize on the identity in fact you will uh, maximize uh, on the but you could equivalently normalize identity and minimize this alpha f m this is the equation that you get so i think the answer is that uh you will so if you would, uh, sorry uh, let me say uh, let me actually do it so if you you're saying we want to uh normalize on this so this would become like minus one ah okay yes you're saying and then we uh yes we take this to the other side if i fight by it and we can uh then we in that case you want to you have minus one uh, this so you would want to minimize this uh, let me see, does it work? Is it equivalent? So now we're minimizing. I believe in the feasible region uh, in, in the in the loud region it should be equivalent. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because we are computing something physically bound on L squared, L lambda squared. If this bound really exists and it's finite, then I think it should yeah. be really brilliant. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering why you, you, you decided to normalize with respect to another operator suddenly, but maybe it's equivalent. Right. I think the yeah the logic why I did it is because it looked easy if you look at this equation to see uh, that you get the correct graph. But uh, yeah. But no, <clears throat> alpha on, on the one is minus one or something that, or on negative at least, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Right, alpha will be negative. Uh, sorry, alpha on the on one will be, and now, yeah, will be negative if you want, uh, yeah, in the feasible uh, yes. If your upper bound is a neg is a negative number, then it says that you can't get a solution to crossing unless you include this negative uh, non-unitary uh, contribution. And so you can only find that in what in the if you only were solving the feasibility problem, you would consider the the the, the infeasible region, the not allowed region. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, so similarly, if you even if you're interested in finding the allowed and disallowed region, then it can still be smart to not just put uh, like the zero objective, but actually put something that gives you meaningful information about how to move towards the boundary. Uh, uh, sorry, Martin. 
Yes. Uh, could you could you please go back one slide? You were saying something about you should be careful. Uh, no, one slide. Yeah, uh, sorry, lower. that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I so if you want to find a lower bound, actually intuitively you can easily understand that uh, if you want to find a lower bound on one OPE, but you also allow in your spectrum an operator that's continuously connected to this operator, because then the maximization you can just say, okay, let's put infinitely low uh, for the exact operator that you are solving, but put a compensating uh, big OPE in the operator that is continuously connected to it, so slightly high. And uh, yeah, you can also see it in the, in the terms of what you would do is that you would start normalizing uh, on normalizing with the uh, with the operator, but demanding positivity on operators that are directly continuously connected. Uh, so yeah, this both both physically and numerically, it's clear that you get a problem if you want to find a lower bound of an operator like say the stress tensor, but you also allow any operator of spin to, yeah, for the reasons I just said, because then there will be like the, let's say the, 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 the equals D plus epsilon operator that can have an, uh, very high OP, while the actual stress tensor has a very low one. And this can just arbitrarily, uh, Take it so the lower rent can be uh, arbitrarily low in that case. Is this clear? Yeah, thanks. So, if you want to find the lower bound, but you need this sometimes a question of interest, for example, on the central charge, then you will have to make some assumption that the next spin two operator has some gap after the stress tensor. Um, yeah, so similarly, you can choose your objective and your uh, uh, norm smartly so that you get some extra information uh, of so that you know that there is this function that should cross zero exactly at the boundary. And if you compute it, then it gives some value. And especially if you can also compute its gradient, then you can see how it changes locally, then you can see how you should find this boundary, which is especially important in larger dimensions where just searching the whole space will be impossible. Uh, yes, so the tutorial will also uh, show an example of how to compute the navigator function. Um, so you can think for most part in this polynomial matrix problem where you if are looking for these uh, functional x positive on these polynomials. Okay. Um, but in the end, what we will be solving is a related semi-definite problem because that has an efficient way to, be, to solve it without discretizing over this delta. Um, and in fact, yeah, this semi-definite program uh, appears in two ways because one is that you can uh, over delta, but the other eye is that if you have multi correlators, then your constraints are inherently that you get from crossing involve uh, positive uh, semi definiteness of some uh, matrices. And uh, so, again, both of these things can be uh, handled. Definite problem. And yeah, it's exactly what uh, STPB, this software STPB that's used in the community, was created for. And STPB. Uh, yeah, it's an arbitrary precision solver because it turns out that you need high precision in order to uh, make things work. And uh, STB is actively being maintained, so it should be software to solve this for your bootstrap problems. So, um, yeah, you might ask, why is this possible? Why can we write this polynomial matrix problem as a semi-definite program. And that is because positivity of a polynomial can be related to the, the existence of some positive definite matrices. This comes from a theorem, it's due to Hilbert, where um, you can see, show the equivalence between a polynomial being positive for 
extracted positive, uh, positive or uh, greater equal zero for x greater equal than zero. That that is equivalent to being able to write the polynomial as a sum of squares plus x times another sum of squares. So one direction is easy to see that if you would write it like that, then you would have a term that is always positive and a term that is that uh, changes sign on the uh, at x equals zero. And so you see that this function has exactly this behavior. Uh, and of course, the other direction is uh, less intuitive, but you can show it. Uh, in order to show it, it's easiest to uh, define a vector like this that has um, components one x x squared blah, 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 until x to the power d, where d is the degree of f in this case, and we say that f is if f is a is such a sum of squares, then that that by definition means that it can be written in this form with a sum over uh, well these coefficients contracted with polynomial squares. And if you can write f like that, then that means that you can write it like this. which means that you can write it in terms of a positive semi-definite matrix that it, uh, so that in the end uh, you can show that the equivalence between the the, the the px being greater than zero for x greater than zero yeah, that is equivalent to writing it in um, this way where x of a and b are positive semi-definite matrices. And so you can show that the search for this uh, for this uh, alpha acting on these polynomials it actually is, can be written as a search uh, for positive semi-definite matrices. And that's what's done in STPP. So, so um, <clears throat> somehow you're also using that every positive semi-definite matrix can be written as the sum of these uh, c um, c transposed no right right which is is true this is the the, the fact that uh uh that there is this uh, this called trelesky decomposition any semi-definite okay. uh, matrix mm. and then you have two, but you have two matrices no yes but you just do it twice there's no it, direction with the fact that you have to uh, sorry I, I didn't define i sorry i didn't define uh so xd prime is uh the same but with degree d prime where d prime is the degree of g another question that i mean i tried to uh, play around and i found multiple solutions under some circumstances. Right. I, I think it's not a unique. Wait. Uh, so the decomposition is not unique, but I mean, does it, what does it mean for your program? So I think in STPB, when you convert it, a choice is uh, made. And uh, <clears throat> I think that this is fine and should not affect the numerics which choice is made. Would it be possible either to, to see a precise statement of this theorem or at least get the name of it? Because Hilbert did a lot of stuff, right? So uh, I've been looking in the... <laughs> oh, um, it is cited in uh, both the paper. I will send links for, for where it's uh, is cited. I had a bit of problem finding the proof because the proof is in a Ger <laughs> German paper. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I can I, I can look into more detail. I was already uh, frantically searching for the proof. Uh, but... Actually, what is the problem? I just said, so do people are uh, have problems with the with, with which direction of this arrow people have problems? Kai, uh, like do, do, do are you unhappy with the left direction or with the right direction? 
No matter right direction is trivial, but <clears throat> so the left direction, and I, I'm saying the decomposition is not unique. Yeah, it's not unique. What um, it's not a problem. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, I, I would like to see the proof of Hilbert theorem if you can give me the reference. It'd be nice. It's yeah, in the review. I, I saw it. We'll give you the reference. But also the, here, what we need is even a, a slightly more general theorem, which would be true not just for polynomials, but for polynomial semi-definite functions. Uh, but that generalization has also been proven, I think. Right. So, so to keep, keep things, I, I can or you just present in more detail the technical details of how the exact Polynomial matrix is also when it involves uh, constraints that are already of the form of positive semi-definiteness uh, inherently before this, not uh, apart from this, uh, how this is all implemented in SCPB in order to convert it. Uh, but uh, I think it gets quite technical when you uh, go to that. And it's not necessary to in order to start bootstrapping. So I hope that this gives an idea of why this is possible. And uh, yeah, if, if more details are uh, requested, uh, request them. Uh, yeah. So the main tool that is used in the bootstrap is this program called STPB, which should be available uh, for across pl platforms through Docker. Uh, I've tried through Docker in Ubuntu and it works. In Ubuntu, it's also easy to install it directly. But um, I heard that in if you use iOS, then the newest version of Docker has a bug, and you should be using uh, 3.2.2. So yeah, there are some details also in the notebooks with links. Uh, um, so STPB takes as inputs some directory that contains text files in JSON. It's all technical, but what you need to know is that you don't really need to know this because what you really need to do is just write a polynomial matrix problem. And then there are already pre-existing notebook files that will do this uh, export into the formats as required by STPB. And so, yeah, exactly. The, the notebook will include uh, uh, example of the uh, code in STPB that's used to do this. Uh, so, so you, really, what you have to specify is this objective normalization factor. These polynomials, or actually vectors of polynomials that you're non positivity on, and okay, it could be vectors of matrices of polynomials if you're doing multi-correlator studies, and SPB will assume that you want to solve positivity for all x greater than zero, which means that if you want to do exactly the case, then you will have to just shift x so that x equals zero the, 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 the point that you want to ask positivity from. So in the case, if for instance, you would want to shift it so that delta, that so that it comes that corresponds to the unitarity bound. Or if you're for a specific, let's say j equals zero, l equals zero, uh, maximize the gap on the first scalar, then you should shift it so that it corresponds to the gap that you want to test, like 1.3 or something. And similarly, sometimes you want to ask uh, positivity on one specific vector, but not to anything connect continuously connected to it. This is what happens when you are want to find like an island under the assumption that there's only one relevant operator of the type. And in this case, you just have to replace this x with a number, and then uh, STPB will correctly only impose positivity for uh, number. So, so yeah, behind the 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 the. the uh, the curtain, there's a few details to this. So we, we saw this is you uh, want to compute derivatives of involves these conformal blocks. Well, derivatives of conformal blocks. There's a standard tool to compute those. 
got scalar blocks and it's uh, included with stpp so we can call that to uh, that's the derivatives that you need and then you have to put these together correctly to form these uh, vectors and uh, convert it to the correct input for stpp and so uh, yeah some interface some example interface that shows all of this uh, uh, is included in the notebook that I shared. Uh, there's a technical comment that I don't know whether I actually should explain, but uh, yeah, scalar blocks, the, the way that the rational approximation is handled is not optimal for convergence, it is found. And uh, so you might want to look at also at things that do the same but similar, but uh, in a way that the numerics uh, run a bit nicer, which, for example, is, is, is such a computation of the formal block approximation is included in simple boot by Mingsu. Um, but either way, the, the results are correct. Uh, and if you get the primal, it's primal. Uh, sorry, if you get the point that's excluded, it's excluded. And if you get a point that is uh, excluded, it's excluded. But, uh, the convergence in STPP uh, turns out to depend a bit on. Uh, but for now, since this is not the easiest when you're just getting started, we will just use scalar, the standard scalar blocks. So, what is the problem in STPP? I mean, the scalar block uh, code? Uh, so, it turns out that so uh, when you have. Well, where do we, okay. When you have. So we saw that the, 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 uh, in this form, where you have some positive function times this polynomial. Mm -hmm. And well, in order, in order to write the derivatives as this positive function times the polynomial, in fact, when you compute these derivatives, naturally they come as uh, a sum over uh, some residue by a pole. And so the way to get uh, get a polynomial out of this is to multiply by all the poles that are present. So you have like uh, one over delta minus uh, well, they're all below the unitarity bound. Uh, so uh, minus uh, some negative number. And if you multiply by all, of, if you multiply your derivatives as they come naturally by all of the the the, the 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 poles in the denominator then you get what is left over is a denominator this function here is positive for all um uh, delta uh, above the unitarity bound which is where we will be wanting to demand positivity and um you can also multiply by an extra pole that is not actually appearing in this some naturally and just also uh, divide by it here and nothing changes in the equations and uh, everything should still hold but it turns out that if you that the numerics work as uh, converge as quickly as nicely and so yeah scalar blocks does not use like the minimal set of uh, these poles that it could use and uh, because of that, I think that exactly the same, but because of that, you just observe that you don't get, for instance, these uh, dual jumps where you suddenly. Uh, okay, I didn't explain it yet. I don't explain that. Uh, well, okay, you have. Uh, so, SAPB wants to solve uh, 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 both the, the dual problem, which is the problem of finding a functional uh, and some primal problem, which is uh, related to it at the same time. And by solving both, it's uh, error so that it can confidently say either that the point is allowed or that it is uh, disallowed. And sometimes you have, so, OK, to solve the point method is used, which means that uh, some optimization method is used, but it has to step within the constraints of positive semi -day. The important part is that usually, because of it's like a constraint optimization, it cannot take 
the ideal steps within the bounds within these constraints but sometimes it can and when it does uh the precision the error greatly loses just in one step and so this is a good thing that you want to see because it means that you uh that the problem converges and it's just observed that if you don't use the like the best block approximation then you will not you will observe that the primal error sometimes quickly goes down but you will not see the same for the dual error it will just steadily decrease and decrease and eventually uh be small enough when the balls are predicted i mean uh, they're given by using this uh, some logic of recursion validation so how can you get it around right um so well first of all initially they're given by that but you can also use less of them uh, because there's an uh, in the approximation you can see which ones uh, are uh, helpful to the subs and you can see so so what we want is a function we wanted a month positivity on a function and we only care about uh, what the function looks like for delta for instance above the unitarity which means that actually a lot of the the behavior near these poles below the unitarity bound you're not interested in and so you can approximate the function by a function with less uh with less of these poles and why does that help um why do we want to do that it's because we showed basically the the, the, the SDP problem um how have so when you instead of discretizing uh sort of when you discretize delta, how heavy the numerics are depends on delta you discretize on. Here, if you use this method, it will be uh, of the polynomial. So how big a matrix you require is uh, determined by the degree of the polynomials. And so what actually gets done is that you approximate uh, uh, approximate the polynomial by a function that has less of these poles because you're not interested in how it behaves somewhere below the unitary bound. You only want to approximate how it behaves above the unitary bound. And so, so the observation is that the way that uh, scalar blocks does that is does not give you this uh, ideal numerics where it, uh, where you get. I mean, I thought scalar blocks is doing this, no, like approximating some poles. Right. Some sort of a neighboring ones, and then um, yeah. right. So scalar blocks is doing this, and it's it, the approximation is fine. I mean, there's not that the blocks, the the blocks are the derivatives of the block from blocks are accurate, but it's just an observation about the the convergence that the way it did it, and you can show that if you take out some some uh, poles and you do the same thing in scalar blocks. But not uh, using a contribution, uh, you not you're not using some blocks, then you get uh, a speed up in the numerics. But uh, yeah, but but you know, in SDPB in the original SDPB paper, there was some prescription for how to determine this prefactor and so on. So. Uh, this scalar block complements the old prescription from SDPB or paper by Simons Daffa, or does it do something completely different? So the uh, prescription of Ning Su, it's something that he just discovered, but it's not written in any paper. What are we talking about here? Right. So I think that indeed, like the, 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 this problem is not described, described in any paper, I, I think. Okay, so it's some trick to change normalization of these polynomials, which speeds up the numerics. Right. But of course, so it's basically we have this ambiguity of how to extract the prefect. We can extract exponential, or we can extract exponential times some rational function, which just multiplies all polynomials by some other polynomial. And somehow Ning Su observed that that some of these choices speeds up the numerics. Right. But okay, so I think it's the technicality we can. Sure. Okay. Right, but in case some people 
like why do you not because some papers now describe that you get uh like for instance it's dual jump and that's now as a criteria primal and dual jumps a termination for you are used and you might wonder why am i never getting a dual jump and it depends on this uh well i wish it depends on So basically, if you do this, uh, if you do this ch change in the extraction of the prefactor that that uh, Ning has discovered, uh, like intuitively, what does it mean? It mean it basically gives smaller or larger weight to vectors sitting at high dimension. So like intuitively, I can imagine that what happens is that if you, if you extract this prefactor, somehow the vectors at high dimension converge a bit faster. And then, well, in the other case, they just converge asymptotically. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure we, we have to worry about this too much. So if you have a dual jump, then it means you exclude the point, right? Correct, because you, because I always confused by this terminology and probably other people. Sorry, if you have a dual jump, it means that you find the functional. You want to find the functional. And you're saying if you, if you normalize properly, then it somehow happens that you find the functional and then you can terminate. Well, in other cases, you just have to, ra to run asymptotically until some threshold becomes very small. Right. Okay. Okay. And so it's a nice observation. Yeah, it would be nice to understand why, why, why is this happening. PT is not published. If Ning is here, then he should comment maybe. Is he here? Uh, is Ning in the... No, Ning is not here. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so 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 yeah, first part of the exercise will be, uh, the, uh, this will be the boring part of just installing things and seeing that it actually uh, works. Uh, so there are some links in the in the notebook, but also I think that since there's different things might be different on Mac, uh, I think that it's good to just uh, try. And if you get stuck, ask ask on Slack. Also, there might also be other people around who are. I am familiar with Ubuntu. I can help with Ubuntu. There might be other people that I can get to help if you uh, have problems with uh, some other system. Uh, yeah, so I would say uh, that the first, yeah, th that's the first step to just. Uh, it's, um, STPV installed and working. And did I have anything else? Uh, some other tools, but that's not important yet. So I think that now is the time for uh, you to try to install STPV. There's some links in the notebook and I'm happy to help with anything. In, uh, and solve any any problems that arise. Yeah, are there, is there any question? So for this tutorial, I suggest to use the Docker Docker because I've now written the, the, the notebook. Like, so Docker way of write, uh, installing STPV. Uh, if you've already installed STPV, uh, it might still be easiest to uh, also install the Docker. There's no problem with having both. I did this. And Andre Manet, he supplied some uh, I would suggest installation instructions that I will also share 
uh, kind of uh, for an out install the has to be without Docker and also on the uh, eventually would be uh, desired by people. Well, if there are no further questions, then maybe we can conclude this session. And sure, then you can add what questions. people want. If they want to ask questions here, want to Slack, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, does anyone have any questions? Please speak up, otherwise we, we close up the session. So questions about the notebook will be asked next time. Any or... questions, any questions. No, no, yeah, but I haven't yet looked at the notebook. I was asking that like, now I'm going to start right. looking at the notebook, then questions about the notebook, I will ask some some later time. Like uh, There will be time or... to ask questions okay. about the notebook next time. Yeah. Right. Of course, you're also free to just ask them already on uh, on the channel. Thank you. OK, well, um, let's thank Martin and see you. Uh, see you, everyone, soon. Cheers. Can some uh, I, I'll stop oh, the recording and again can this someone that make sure that this uh, session is closed so that the recording will be available. And there uh, was a link. There was a link from uh, Hugh Osborne on, about uh, Wikipedia article containing the proof of. The proof I can add it in the channel. The proof. So take a look at the chat if you want to have a link to. To the Hilbert theorem. I added it in the channel. Uh, okay, Stack channel. Sounds, sounds good. Cheers, Aaron. And with the Mac, I can probably.